Okay, good afternoon, everybody. You're very welcome to this, what is this, our fifth lecture in the, the series this year. Um, it's our penultimate summer school guest lecture. Um, and I'm delighted today to introduce to you Raphael Musan Levy. Raphael is from Jerusalem, but now lives in County Down, not too far from where I am now. Um, he is a classical philologist and a biblical scholar and historian with a master's degree in ancient philology from Paulus, the Jerusalem Institute of Languages and Humanities. He's also an experienced actor and tour guide, so we're expecting great things this afternoon, Raphael. Uh, so today, uh, Raphael is going to talk to us about Athens and Jerusalem in the Corpus Dionysiacum, and I hope I pronounced that correctly. So over to you, Raphael. You unmute yourself. Good afternoon. I'm also delighted, Helen, to join in the summer school lectures. It's a great privilege for me to be able to deliver this lecture to all of you. And I hope I'll be able to provide you with the um, answers to your questions, if there are any, uh, towards the end of, the, of our uh, today's talk. So um, the topic I've chosen is actually the works, uh, medieval works, late Byzantine works, written in Greek called the Corpus Dionysiacum Areopagiticum. This is the Latin term, which is actually, in English, it would just be the works attributed to Pseudo Dionysius, the Areopagite. Uh, these works, in my opinion, are still very much relevant, although most, uh, I would say even students, uh, classical students, history students, medieval students, they don't really, uh, they're not, even if they heard that, such a work or works exist, uh, don't necessarily enter the whole world of uh, the Corpus Dionysiacum. The world of the Corpus Dionysiacum is very wide. It's a very short work. It's a collection of tractates, which are not very long, but nevertheless, they like summarize in a way, all the world of both antiquity, ancient Greek philosophy, Neoplatonism, and of course, biblical and patristic uh, tradition and the works of the early church fathers. So since this world is so big, it's like a whole ocean, there, there should be some sort of uh, major theme uh, which uh, will be able to sort of summarize the importance of this work. So I chose the images of uh, the, con the concepts, not only the geographical uh, cities or points of reference as Athens and Jerusalem, but Athens and Jerusalem as certain ideas, not necessarily uh, cities, Jerusalem, which is, uh, well, it's in a conflict zone between Palestine and Israel and Athens, which is the capital city of the modern uh, uh, state of uh, Greece. We're not talking necessarily about that, although the physical entities, the physical cities, the, the, the polis of Jerusalem and the polis of Athens, uh, of course, do play also their important role. What I mean is that usually Jerusalem is considered to be the place of revelation, the place of um, obedience to the divine will, while Athens is associated with humanism, freedom, inquiry, philosophy, uh, doubt, polyphony of voices. Jerusalem, on the other hand, a sort of theocracy, right? Uh, in a way, a sort of theocratic uh, dictatorship of uh, monotheism, while Athens is polytheistic. So, this is the this this the, these are the concepts the main concepts and we would like to see if both are compatible and in my opinion it is in works such as the corpus dionysiacum which offer us a way of synthesizing both 
uh, both approaches, the approach of prophetism from the Bible, thus said the Lord, you must do this and that, revelation. Uh, and on the other hand, um, the world of Hellenistic thought. As we all know, the whole dichotomy appears in the works of the Latin, North African to be exact, uh, Carthaginian uh, church, Latin church father, Tertullian, who said, what has Jerusalem to do with Athens? The church with the academy, the Christian with the heretic. After Jesus, we have no need of speculation. After the gospel, no need of research. The truth has been found and there is no need of discussion. There is no need of dialectics, logic, science, etc., etc. Um, is this opinion voiced by Tertullian actually the main, would most Greek or Eastern church fathers be in agreement with that? This is the question. Uh, not necessarily so, because for many of the thinkers and uh, philosophers and early church fathers, uh, the world of Hellenism and the world of the Bible were in a way compatible. But nevertheless, this uh, very famous quote from Tertullian offers us, I think, a very convenient point of reference uh, for this uh, particular discussion. Religious uh, fanaticism or uh, self-sufficiency or people who are absolutely sure of being in the right from the one side, and this can be true of all Abrahamic religions, of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam also, uh, in its extreme forms, the same as it is today, right? And in, uh, I would say, alternative religions in our days it could be yoga meditation uh, uh, and uh, alternative spirituality new age for example this is an important point because when we speak of uh, neoplatonism neoplatonism especially neoplatonism we're not necessarily talking of philosophy as it's taught nowadays in academia although of course they were they, they, they had to master maths and science. It was in a way both this, but also it was perhaps in a way similar to uh, alternative spirituality groups which exist nowadays, especially with, the, with meditation, with spiritual practices, et cetera, et cetera. So here you have the point of conflict when Christianity became not just one of the marginal religions, but the state religion under Constantine the Great and all the rest of the uh, Roman Byzantine uh, emperors. So philosophy, according to Aristotle, philosophy begins with a sense of wonder. A person sees the phenomenon, the phenomena in the world, the world phenomena, and he is in a state of amazement, thaumazde, to thaumazden, diagar to thaumazden, hoi anthropoi, kai nun, kai to proton, erg santo philosophein. Human beings started to philosophize out of a state of wonder. And this is very much also important for Dionysius the Areopagite, uh, whose works try to articulate what is um, beyond articulation. When a person sees or comes across a vision or a person or a state which leaves him totally paralyzed, frozen. As Sappho, the Greek poet said, when she sees her beloved, her tongue literally freezes. Ege. Ege is the perfect tense of a uh, the verb which means to be frozen. So it is in this state when you encounter a person, a phenomenon, uh, maybe even an idea or a divinity, a God, let's say, a person who is like a God or God himself, you're left speechless. How to convey this experience which leaves you speechless to other people? This is also one of the things which uh, Neoplatonists were very much 
interested in and dedicated their life to explaining that which is inexplicable. The works of Dionysius the Areopagite are dated, well, most scholars do have no agreement on what is the exact date, but although the character himself, Dionysius the Areopagite, he's mentioned in the book of Acts in the New Testament, he is considered to be one of the philosophers, the Athenian philosophers who converted thanks to Christianity, thanks to the uh, preaching of St. Paul. St. Paul was preaching in Athens. He visited uh, the, uh, the hill of Ares, which is the Areopagos, which is just below the Acropolis. And uh, one of the people who converted was Dionysius. That means this is the first century. However, most scholars agree that the works attributed to this Athenian a convert were actually written by somebody completely different and many centuries later, uh, most likely in the mid fifth or beginning of the sixth century. That means mid fifth or beginning of the sixth century. So the works attributed, written by, attributed to Dionysius, written by an anonymous author, nobody really knows who exactly he is. There are many speculations. I'd have to just dedicate a whole lecture to concerning speculations, concerning the authorship of, the, of these works. Um, these are the critical editions, the German critical editions of the Greek text. And this is written in Greek, in uh, very strange Greek, I would say, because I've been reading these books for the past six years. I can say they're very dissimilar to any other Greek uh, works of Greek literature, uh, uh, I've ever read. It's like, it's its own language. It's uh, the Dionysian uh, uh, vocabulary. So the first uh, volume of the critical edition has the divine names, where a variety of names revealed in the Bible are explained, are discussed. Then you have uh, the second volume, which is uh, the uh, celestial hierarchy. By the way, the word hierarchy, which we all use nowadays, uh, was actually coined by uh, by Dionysius Dariopagite. Okay? Didn't exist before. You had the the, the adjective hierarches, but hierarchia, hierarchy, uh, which means holy order, or divine order, uh, sacred order. This is a, a, a term which appears in the fifth or sixth century with. Uh, Dionysius. So he describes the angelic world, then the ecclesiastical hierarchy, which is the human hierarchy, which consists of the worshipping community. Uh, then he has mystical theology, which was very influential, especially on Thomas Aquinas, and um, letters, which of course are uh, epistles, which are pseudo letters. Some of them are addressed to St. John uh, of Patmos, uh, it's actually like a work of, uh, in many ways, of dialogue, drama, and poetry. So this is not just theology per se or philosophy per se. When you read the works themselves, in many ways, you can see that the author was indeed not only a theologian or a philosopher, but a poet. Uh, here are some works of recent scholarship, uh, one of them uh, written by an English speaking uh, scholar, Andrew Louth of Durham, uh, Denise the Areopagite, was published in the 80s, and one which is rather recent from 2018 or 19, written by uh, Ernesto Sergio Mainoldi. It's supposed to be translated into English. In my opinion, it's the best book on the subject of Dionysius the Areopagite and that's where you'll find the bibliography and hopefully the work will be translated into English. Um, a very, one of my favorites is by Eric D. Pearl, The Neoplatonic Philosophy of Dionysius the Arabic. It's a very short, very, I think, readable and very user-friendly book. 
uh, it could be used also as just an introduction to Neoplatonism, not only to Dionysus, the Arab poet. So this is what I, uh, part of my bibli bibliography. Um, since I'm right now in, 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 Ireland, in Northern Ireland, not far from the border, so it's interesting to mention also Professor John Dillon of Trinity. He also wrote one of the be best books on the subject together with Sarah Ware, Dionysius Diopagite and the Neoplatonist tradition, which shows you also, uh, I'm indebted also to this work. Uh, he tries to prove the way in which the pagan uh, framework was in a way synthesized and transfigured, transferred into the Christian biblical worldview of Dionysius. And this is a book I'm currently reading because it was published a year ago. This is the Oxford Handbook of Dionysius the Areopagite. So if one like myself who's planning on pursuing his studies further on and publishing on the subject, I need to be up to date. So this is the latest, the latest publication by Mark Edwards of uh, Oxford, together with a younger scholar called Dimitrios Palis. And there are some contributions from Northern Ireland also in this book. So, it's, uh, so after we move to the uh, secondary literature, let's see the source. It's always lovely to see the source itself, especially that nowadays one can actually read the manuscripts without being in the library. They're all digitalized. Nearly all of them are digitalized. This is um, from the British Library. It's a ninth century manuscript. What you have here in the center, these uh, two lines, th this is the text itself by Dionysius, right? What you have here is the scholion. The scholion is an interpretation. So the works in the medieval, in the Byzantine and medieval, medieval period, they wouldn't be just published, uh, they wouldn't be distributed on their own. They would always be distributed together with, on the margins, uh, commentaries. The commentary, the definitive commentary was written by uh, Cyril of Scythopolis. Scythopolis is a town in Palestine nowadays. And here's also a local connection. Sorry that I, I chose, I, I just realized afterward that it's the old pounds that used to be in Ireland, uh, but I chose it because of the picture of John Scottus uh, Eugena, the son of Erin, the son of Ireland, the Irish, uh, uh, thinker who was influenced by Dionysius the Areopagite. I don't usually quote from Wikipedia, but I like the fact that he was one of the few Western European philosophers of his day who knew Greek, having studied it in Ireland. So just as Ireland was then a center of Greek and classical studies, hopefully it will be so uh, yet again. So uh, this is the ninth century, and uh, John Scottus Erugena had the uh, privilege of translating the works into Latin. The Latin version was also highly influential later on in the church. And uh, I would say that the almost pantheistic and at the same time Christian approach of St. Dionysius is very similar to the approach of John Scottus Erugina, which unfortunately didn't become the main current of the Catholic Church, for example. John Scottus Erigone is not considered to be a saint in the Catholic Church. Here is also a quotation from a, a, a Deirdre Carbin, who's, a, I, I suppose she's from Belfast. Nowadays she lives in Africa, but she also wrote one of the best books about the unknown God, neg negative theology in the Platonic tradition, Plato to Erigone. Uh, page 306, the whole focus of Erugena's thought can be stated in terms of the Dionysian problematic of how the divine essence, incomprehensible in itself, can be comprehended and spoken of in its manifestation in creation. How God is understood to be both transcendent and imminent, similar and different, hidden and revealed. So this is some of the books written by Derek de Carbin. One of them is on John Scottus Eriugena and uh, Negative Theology. It's very interesting that some of the best uh, scholars in the English-speaking world 
who write about Neoplatonism are in fact uh, from either the Republic of Ireland or Northern Ireland. Um, there are also many French scholars who uh, are specialists in Neoplatonism. So many of the best uh, scholars, modern scholars of Neoplatonism were French. That was in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. Later on in the English speaking world, it was mainly not 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 uh, uh, exclusively but but many of them many of those who contributed to the discussions were in fact uh, irish this is a copy of the latin translation from the renaissance period just to show how important this work indeed was however the oldest version we have the oldest manuscript the oldest redaction is in Syriac. Syriac is a dialect of Aramaic, a language that was spoken in Syria, Palestine, by both uh, Christians and by non-Christians, by pagans and by Jews as well. Uh, Aramaic is similar to Hebrew in many aspects. And uh, this particular manuscript is from the Sinai Monastery. It's important. It's very important for textual analysis and seeing what the earliest version in Greek might have uh, looked like. The translation was made by Sergius of Reshina, who also translated the works of Aristotle and Gallant into Syria. Now, why is this important? It's because from Syriac, these works were later on uh, translated into Arabic because many were bilingual in both Syriac and Arabic. And in this way, many of the works of classicism which were not available in Latin, in the Latin West, were available in the Muslim East via the Syriac translation. So many works of Plato, Neoplatonism, uh, and of course Dionysius the Areopagite were uh, entered the world of Arab and Muslim philosophy through the translations of uh, Syriac um, authors and Syriac church writers. The translation also offers us uh, a terminus of knowing when was the latest that this book could have been written. That's 536 when Sergius of Rashina died. So that's why I would say that the book was written either towards the end of the fifth century or towards the beginning or the first quarter of the sixth century. So as we see Sergius of Rashina, he translated the works of Dionysius and Aristotle as well from uh, Greek to Syriac. So here is Athens, the world of philosophy, of inquiry, poetry, freedom, democracy, this is how the uh, Areopagus uh, looks like nowadays. I must say it's one of my favorite spots in Athens because it's open 24 seven. The Acropolis itself, uh, you, you can't always visit it at night, only if there's special events. Areopagus is open and it's got a lovely nightlife also uh, with youth uh, sitting there and uh, looking at the beautiful view. That's how you see the Acropolis. Uh, from the Areopagus. The Areopagus is the place where the ancient judicial uh, decisions uh, uh, in Athens were made. It's where the trilogy, the Orestia by Aeschylus ends with Orestes being absolved, his uh, judgment uh, uh, for killing his own mother, uh, Clytemnestra, is made in this particular place. It's where the rulers would meet also. And according to the New Testament, it is where St. Paul, with his Jerusalemite theology, preached to the Athenians. So St. Paul comes from the Hebraic tradition. What we see here is the book of Genesis, the book of Genesis. However, in the first century AD, the Bible, of course, existed in Greek as well. We have the Septuagint, which was the first ever translation of the Bible. So when St. Paul would preach, he would preach in Greek, not in Hebrew. And uh, naturally, there were some uh, converts, pagan converts to Judaism, who could later on convert 
to Christianity as well. So St. Paul would mainly preach in Roman Greek, Roman synagogues. Yes, there were Greco-Roman synagogues. There was what we call Hellenistic Judaism. That means Jews who prayed and thought in Greek. So the connection between Athens and Jerusalem, in a way, existed even before the period of the New Testament. Here we have an image of St. Paul from the book called uh, St. Paul the Convert. It's a very good book written by Alan Siegel. He himself, he's a, uh, I'm not sure if he's a practicing Jew, but he, it's a Jewish author who writes about the Jewish aspect of St. Paul. And here we have one uh, illumination from one of the manuscripts of Dionysius the Areopagite. So according to the book of Acts, According to the book of Acts, 16th uh, 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 chapter, chapter 16, uh, verses 22, 23, St. Paul preaches the unknown God to the Athenians. He tells them that they are actually very pious and he's amazed by the way in which they're seeking uh, truth. He doesn't tell them off. He doesn't say, oh, you're all good for nothing, pagans, and only the God of Abraham is with us. He, he does a completely different tactic using... Um, his missionary skills, and he stands amongst them in the uh, hill of Aris and says that they're very pious, and he th sees also that they have a special altar, Bormos, where it says a dedication to the unknown God, Agnosto Theo. Further on, he says that in him, in this unknown God, whose name is not known, in him we live and move and exist or have our being, as it's usually translation. And as St. Paul says to the Athenians, and as some of your own poets, he's quoting Greek poets, have said, we are of his, of his race or we are of his, his, uh, uh, um, of his kind, Tugar Kai Genos Esmen. This is a quote, quotation from Aratus the Stoic. So here we already see that even in uh, St. Paul's uh, preaching, there is already the connection between Jerusalem and Athens in the fact that he's quoting in a positive way uh, a Greek uh, a poet, let us begin with Zeus, whom we mortals never leave unspoken, for every street, every marketplace is full of God. Even the sea and the harbor are full of this deity. Everywhere, everyone is indebted to God, for we are indeed his offspring. Genos. So St. Paul was actually quoting him. And this is something very similar to what actually Dionysius himself does. He uses uh, Neoplatonist, pagan Neoplatonist philosophy in a positive way, in a way transfiguring it and changing it. According to our chronology, as we saw, uh, the works attributed to St. Dionysius were distributed during the reign of Augustus. I'm uh, sorry, Justinian I, who was Augustus, he became emperor of the Roman Empire. Since I don't want this to be an abstract, just history of ideas, we need to try and imagine how the Roman Empire looked in this period. It didn't get better afterwards, I must tell you. This was perhaps the last period where, during the Byzantine era, uh, the Byzantine emperor, Empire actually looked like Rome is supposed to look like both parts of the empire, almost both parts, but Italy itself was reunited, even some parts of Gaul, all of North Africa. So, I mean, practically all the Mediterranean basin was part of the Roman Empire. It didn't last for long, but nevertheless, uh, Justinian, he was the last emperor who actually spoke Latin as his first tongue. So he spoke both Greek and Latin, uh, the fact that we know of Roman law to our days, it's thanks also to the codex written by Justinian. According to recent scholarship, he may have been, the emperor Justinian, may have been also the main mastermind behind the production, distribution of the Corpus Dionysiacum. 
that doesn't mean he wrote it himself. Uh, it does mean that he was like the executive producer of this work. That means he personally knew the convert, the Greek convert to Christianity who wrote this book. Justinian had a lot of building projects. One of the most famous one is this church of, and the monastery of St. Catherine in Sinai. He also built many churches in Jerusalem, in Constantinople. The most famous one is of course, St. Sophia, the, the temple of holy wisdom, the cathedral of holy wisdom, which perhaps would have looked like that. Yeah, nowadays it's a mosque again, after it became a, 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 a museum in the early 20th century uh, during Ataturk, it was a museum and now again, it's a mosque. However, it was built as a church and it was also planned by Justinian. So I would say that the works of Dionysius are in a way the conceptual ideological um, theory behind the practice of building these churches. So this is not just a work of speculative uh, philosophy or theology, it, it, in a way, it gives you the idea of the aesthetic behind these churches and behind the aesthetic, which has come to be the, the, the Byzantine aesthetic, the Byzantine tradition. When speaking of Neoplatonism, one must speak also of their idea of being. What God is, is he a super being? Is he beyond being? What type of being is he? Now, in Exodus, in the biblical book of Exodus, in the Bible, uh, God, the Lord God, appears to Moses in the burning bush. And Moses said, what will I say unto the children of Israel when I see them? Who sent me? Who has sent me to, to Pharaoh? And the answer is in Hebrew, Eheye sent you. The word Eheye could be translated as I will be, or I am, or I exist. The verb uh, used in Greek is ho on, which is a participle, masculine. Ho on, the being, or the existence, the being has sent you. Say unto them, the being, ho on. The being has sent me unto you. So already we have in uh, the Bible already a, philosoph uh, a philosophical term, because in Greek philosophy, on has a very particular meaning. So here we have to skip a bit to Plotinus, who is considered the father of Neoplatonism, and see what exactly was his idea of being. He found a, an association between being and intelligibility. For him, whatever is intelligible, whatever thinks has being. But then what is the principle of being? The principle of being cannot be another being because then there's no end to that. If the principle of limited being is an unlimited being, it's still a being. So he came to the conclusion or received a certain platonical current of thought that the principle of existence is beyond existence or transcendental. The word he uses is epekeina, beyond. Epekeina or hyperousios. Hyperousios, beyond essence, beyond being. Not supreme being, but beyond being. He also considered himself to be a part of a golden chain of philosophers from Plato, which continued uh, till the first century also and beyond. Um, th they had a very special way of interpreting Homer's uh, uh, reference in the Iliad, where he says that, uh, where Zeus says that none of the gods, even if they all gather together, could drag him down with a golden chain but that if he, Zeus, pulled the golden chain, he could pull them all with earth and sea and bind them to the summit of Olympus. This is the Homeric golden chain 
which can uh, drag all upwards. So Plato, actually, it's very possible that Homer, what he meant is just a typical whimsical way of describing Zeus and not necessarily some deep uh, philosophical meaning, but that's exactly how Neoplatonists saw it. They saw it as a great chain of being which bears everyone, carries them all, and draws them further up towards the good. The good, according to Plato, is also in the Republic, is said to be that the existence is derived from the good, but the good itself is not being or essence, but it transcends essence. Epekeina tes usias. Epekeina beyond being. So whatever Plato himself meant in this, uh, it's open to different interpretations, but for Plotinus and for other uh, Neoplatonist uh, thinkers, it meant that the principle of being is beyond being and is transcendent to being, but not a super being. Plotinus was also translated in the early 20th century by a journalist who never actually studied, didn't even have a degree, as far as I know, Stephen McKenna. It's a fantastic translation. Um, there is another translation by Loeb. This is the works of Plotinus. It's uh, translated by Armstrong. I like both translations, actually. And just uh, there's also... Uh, another work on Plotinus. Yeah. The basic premises of the for the Plotinian position on being is that being is intelligible. That means being is equated with what in Greek is called the nous. Nous is like mind, intelligence, just intelligence, not in the modern way of how understanding what intelligence is, but intelligence. Intellectus also is the higher part of man, the part which can ascend to the divine forms. But intelligence is also being. Intelligence is not beyond being, it's on the level of being. So the ontology of all beings is in the act of thinking or of intellection. As Parmenides says in his poem of being, it is the one and the same thing to be intelligible or to think and to exist. Togarauto noein estin, noein is the infinitive of noesis, noein, to think, and to be. Einai is also the infinitive in Greek of to be. So being and thinking are equated as one and the same. That means that whatever is intelligible to the intellect or even to the spiritual intellect of man is not the one. It's not the God because God cannot be intelligible. If you can grasp him, if it's intelligible, if it can be put in a box like a genie, then it's not the one. It's not God. It's not God is inintelligible or super intelligible. Latinian philosophy, you also have the triad of the hen, the one, which is beyond being, nous, which is intellect, which is the spiritual aspect of the world, and he also imagines a world spirit, and the soul, the spirit and soul, not, not one and the same thing, the soul, the psyche, which is the emotional, physical part of, of the human being. So you have the hen, the nous and the psyche, but they also interpenetrate and participate in one another. I'm not going to read this because we don't have time. After Plotinus, who was more of a solitary thinker of the one thinker ascending to the one beyond uh, existence and be beyond being, you had a more, I would say, down to earth, uh, a philosopher called Iamblichus, who was from Syria, and he believed that in order to attain to pure wisdom, one must not only not only philosophize, but what, one must participate in the cults, that means the pagan cults, 
For him, the most uh, ancient and correct cults were the cults of the Egyptians, of the Chaldeans, and of the Syrians. He himself was a Syrian. So uh, he wrote a book which is called About the Mysteries of the Egyptians and the Chaldeans and Others. After him, you have the period of Proclus. And the thing is that modern scholarship which, uh, of, of, of the Corpus de Anisiacum, which started in the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, determined that the works attributed to, to Saint Dionysius, the Athenian convert of Saint Paul, were not actually written by him, but, but written by another author. That was thanks to philologists who discovered a lot of parallels in the language of the Corpus Dionysiacum and the works of Plotinus, Iamblichus, and especially Proclus, including a whole paraphrase of a work written by Proclus. That means that our mysterious unknown author actually knew, uh, knew Proclus and read him and was familiar with him. One of the first English translations of Proclus was also made by Dodds, who was from uh, County Down, the same county I'm living in right now. He was from uh, Banbridge. Proclus also wrote uh, commentaries on Plato. So the fact that we actually have the works of Plato and the critical editions of Plato use the commentaries written by Proclus, the Athenian head of the Athenian Academy. The last head of the Academy was Damascinus, who also has uh, was most likely a contemporary of our mysterious author. And our mysterious author also incorporated the idea of the triad of procession, the one which all, with, all the time proceeds out of his goodness, proceeds but remains in the same place, and at the same time offers other created beings to return. So this is a sort of circle of the Proodos, that's the procession. At the same time, he remains in the same place. He moves, but yet rem remains unmoved. The, and the epistrophe, the return back to the one of the souls who return to the one. So all this sounds very philosophical and very pagan uh, from the biblical point of view. However, uh, our author managed to combine it, and he was not the only one who created such a patchwork. One of the uh, uh, remarkable and um, really unusual uh, authors of antiquity was uh, the Empress Eudocia. She created an amazing patchwork called the Homerocentos. And they were actually, it's uh, taking bits, fragments, pieces of Homer and reshaping them in order to create the history of the creation of the world according to the Bible, the fall, uh, the incarnation of Christ, uh, and his resurrection. So these Homerical stitchings were created by a woman who was, and one at the same time, familiar, more than familiar. She was an expert in uh, Greek uh, literature. And at the same time, she was a very pious uh, Christian. And she managed to combine these things. In my opinion, not many scholars agree with that. I believe that these Homerical stitchings by the Empress Eudocia, in a way, they prefigure what our author uh, Dionysius, the Areopagite, was actually doing. He was using, uh, in the same spirit of Plotinus, the word epekeina plus the genitive, like epekeina tes usias, epekeina uh, onton, or etc. etc. Then uh, you can find this many times in the works himself. The Neoplatonic concept of beyond being, hyperusios, is met 81 times, and he managed even to popularize it because the idea of God beyond being is not really common in patristic thought before the fifth, sixth century. God and the Trinity are actually 
seen as beings, as supreme beings. But with Dionysius, the term beyond being is accepted. And it's not only accepted in academia or among theologians, uh, even in popular piety. If we take, for example, a prayer in the modern Orthodox Greek church, uh, written in the Byzantine times, uh, a sort of Christmas carol, I would say. Today, the Virgin is uh, bringing birth to the one who is beyond being. Heparthene semeron hyperusion tikte. She is giving birth to the hyperusios. So these ideas were not just for some. Uh, 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 specialists in the theology, they actually became a part of uh, everyday, even church life in certain places. The theme also of uplifting, anagoge, taken from Proclus, assimilated by uh, Dionysius, the Areopagite. However, there are differences because for him, for Dionysius, the one is equated with the Trinity. So it's not like he sees a one beyond being, and this one beyond being is in a higher position than the Trinity, and then you have all the rest. No, for him, the one beyond being is the Trinity. This might seem as some sort of inconsistency or paraconsistency. Um, perhaps it is, uh, but it also has its own logic, and it is the, the logic which is the logic of revealed uh, biblical faith, although it doesn't really fit with Aristotelian logic, I would say. So for him, the hen was the same as the triada, the same as the Holy Trinity. Unlike other Neoplatonists, and although he had very strong Neoplatonist sympathies, uh, he does not see the primordial uh, religion as Egyptian or Chaldaic or whatever. Now, Proclus, Iamblichus, Plotinus and uh, Damascus, they were really uh, uh, very enthusiastic about ancient Egypt, uh, ancient uh, Babylon, and, and et cetera, et cetera. In Dionysius, you don't find that. His only point of reference is the Bible. He interprets the Bible using, however, the vocabulary of his pagan peers. And all this happening in the period when Justinian is finally closing the Athenian Academy. The closure of the Athenian Academy corresponds with the distribution of the works of uh, Dionysius, the Areopagite. This cannot be a coincidence. Before we end, I, had, I, I, I would like to continue, but we're now coming to an end now. Our lecture is not more than an hour. Uh, I would like to pay attention because we, we were just talking around about Dionysus, but we haven't read anything of his right now. From his mystical theology, it starts, the book Mystical Theology, the tractate, starts with a direct prayer to the one God, to the Holy Trinity. Now, what's interesting, even of just taking this small fragment, trias, I didn't put it in Greek just to, to show off that I, I know Greek. No, um, it's because it's very hard to translate. And there are very various ways how you can translate. You can, first of all, it, the trias, hyperousia, this is in the vocative. It's direct speech. It's not spoken to some abstract entity. The vocative in Greek, just like as in Latin, it, usually it's used when you're approaching uh, uh, when in direct speech some other person. So here the Trinity is beyond being, but he's like saying, oh, Trinity, being beyond being, God beyond God, good or goodness beyond goodness. So us, usia is, or usios is the, Hyper usie is adding the hyper, like hyper, like hyperactive, hyper usie, hyper fair, that means God beyond God, but it's the Trinity anyway. It's not a God beyond the Trinity. Kai hyper agathe. 
So if you just even repeat this like a sort of mantra, you can see that it really, it's a very special way of using language. And I would like also to end by saying that this influence, this, uh, his combination of philosophy, Aristotelianism, Neoplatonism, uh, influenced not only the Latin West, not only the Byzantine Greek world, it influenced Arab Muslim philosophy, it influenced indirectly Jewish mysticism as well. When I read in Aramaic the, the Zohar, which is a work of Kabbalah, which is also very Neoplatonist, uh, the similarities, the linguistic similarities are very hard not to notice especially when one reads Dionysius in the Syriac Aramaic version uh, of uh, Sergius of Roshaina. The similarity is striking because in Muslim and Jewish mysticism, you're also approaching the biblical God, which is very anthropomorphic in the Psalms, you know, the God walking in the garden, uh, getting angry, destroying Sodom and Gomorrah, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it doesn't really fit in a very scientific philosophical world, but in the Dionysian synthesis, his idea of God who is, who is not, because to say God is, is also wrong, because whatever is, is limited and can die. So he actually says that God isn't, he is not, which is also a bit Buddhist. So in this way, uh, I think that he manages to combine the worlds, the conceptual worlds of philosophy, of free thought also, of speculation, and at the same time, showing his respect to the world of the Bible, of both the Old Testament and the New Testament. As I said, the whole cosmos of Dionysius the Areopagite is very, very large, and you could go on and on, and I'm very enthusiastic about it, but I've already overdone uh, the time. I can see that there's a chat over here. Yes, so I answered about Kabbalah, right? There is a connection, yes, certainly. Cogito uh, ergo sum, yes, yes, it does come from the Greeks. Eheye, ki eheye. Eheye Asher Eheye, but this is not a Hebrew class. Whoever wants to join, I'm a he biblical Hebrew teacher. I can teach that as well. Uh, good to see our lectures are attracting ever younger audience. I agree also. If there are any more uh, questions or suggestions or criticisms, um, maybe there are some specialists in neoplatonism.